My name is Dr. Stuart Factor. I'm a neurologist at Emory University, and it's a great privilege today for me to be interviewing my colleague, Dr. Malin DeLong. Dr. DeLong is professor of neurology and uh, Timmy chair at Emory University and is past chairman of the Department of Neurology, and he is also an honorary member of the Movement Disorder Society. Uh, Malin, can we uh, start at the beginning? Um, early days, how you were influenced, how you became interested in neuroscience. Right, so I think I began uh, during undergraduate, uh, my interest in neuroscience, although I started as a physics math major, uh, switched to history, <coughs> and ended up with that undergraduate degree, but... Uh, and, and you were at Stanford at the time. I was at Stanford, yeah. As, yeah. And uh, in my last year there, I had gone a year abroad a year in Germany and uh, was doing part of the history interest. Uh, came back and, and realized that I had to get back to science, something or get, which I all my life uh, focused on, although I love history. Uh, and I started working in a couple labs, and I took a course or two in biology and soft science. I had all done hard science before and got very excited by living issue, life uh, itself. And uh, By hard and, science, you mean physics and... Yeah, yeah. Uh, physics and math and yeah. chemistry and those. And uh, I had a really fortunate experience in uh, meeting Don Kennedy when he had just come to Stanford. Uh, who had been at Harvard and then Syracuse and came there as Don Kennedy. This is Don Kennedy who went on to become president of Stanford and FDA and uh, editor of science, you know, mm -hmm. the Don Kennedy. And, uh, but at that time it was Don Kennedy who was just a wonderful person and uh, spent time with him, both he and uh, both myself and Howard Fields actually were with him the first year he was setting up his lab. Uh, I did a graduate year with him in physiology, uh, working on invertebrates. Got, that's how I really got launched, I would say. Uh, and uh, had to decide then, I knew it was medical school uh, because I wanted to do something with people. Uh, and uh, Don's advice to me was, go east, young man. Uh, <laughs> go back to Har go to Harvard, because he had come from there. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, I was a California guy. You know, I really grew up all my time in California. But I thought, okay, I'll look at it. So in the end, of course, I ended up, I went there and had a wonderful uh, education and experience. It was one of the best neuroscience departments. It was not called neuroscience at that time. There was no such concept, mm -hmm. hardly. Uh, the, first, the first term was neurobiology uh, that Ted Bullock uh, introduced. Uh, we got later to call it neuroscience. But, Neuroscience was coming up in every department, anatomy, physiology. Uh, so you just sort of picked your department and there were plenty of people uh, starting to do that. <clears throat> and when I finished medical school, I, I knew I was going to, into neurology. I, I had an interesting experience uh, during my freshman year in medical school. I had, I had just finished the anatomy course, or was working on anatomy, and this was in February. Uh, when uh, I came down with a very severe viral, presumably meningoencephalitis, and was hospitalized at the Peter Bent Brigham uh, for a number of, well, a week or two, uh, and uh, developed myoclonus and a lot of central nervous system problems. You're, you're in the ICU for a little while? Or? I wasn't, in, I don't mm -hmm. think we had ICUs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just, and I had, you know, repeated taps and all of that. and. Uh, so the reason for telling the story is that they, they brought in one of the world's great uh, researchers and clinicians uh, in the basal ganglia, and of course that was Derek Denny Brown, uh, who I had no idea who that was when, when I saw when he came to see me, but I remember looking up at him, and I still have that image of him, uh, and I, I remember him sort of mutter, muttering uh, myoclonus, and I thought, well, what is myoclonus? <laughs> anyway, I. Did you see him just the one time? Or? One, the one time, yeah. He was brought over to mm -hmm. you know, probably do grand round or to another attending or something. I, don't, I really don't know. Uh, but uh, after that, uh, I got very interested in 
the field of basal ganglia. I mean, just knowing then Denny Brown, and I spent time at Boston City Hospital. That was my home base, really, uh, and the neurology program there was superb. This was always, well, I was in medicine, but uh, but I you went, didn't do neurology there. Though. I didn't do neurology there, but I went to all the neurology <clears throat> grand rounds, uh, which were on Saturday morning. Right. And everybody came, and it was a fabulous uh, introduction. The to world's it. changed a lot. Nobody would come on Saturday. Nobody anymore. would come probably <laughs> today. But that, that, was a, that was a unique mm -hmm. time. I was mean, some tremendously uh, very good people there. But even but, at that time, while you were doing internal yeah. medicine, you knew you still wanted to do research. Right, yeah. right. And, oh, I came out of medical school very much determined to do research. Uh, the question was where and what. And uh, this was the Vietnam era, so I was faced with a dilemma of going to Vietnam or going to the NIH or some other place, which would have been a uniform service. So I, I, I looked at the NIH, of course, which a lot of people did at that time. and. Uh, was able to get into one of the just best places in the world, which was the, the laboratory of Ed Everts. Uh, you said looking back at NIH, that was your most fun time in your career. So, oh, the so tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, the NIH was a unique experience. It was, uh, I, I, I went there thinking two years and spent five. Uh, and uh, when I got to the lab, Actually, before I got to the lab, because there was some planning going on, I was figuring out what, what I was going to do. And uh, the lab was, you know, the place in the world to go for recording single unit activity uh, from behaving primates. That was Ed's uh, major uh, focus. He had uh, started in the motor cortex. Um, Emilio Bizzi had come and was had carved out the frontal eye fields. Uh, Tom Thatch had come a year or two before me and was charged with the cerebellum. And uh, as I tell the story, uh, there was not much choice left <laughs> when I uh, got there. Uh, the basal ganglia were things that were left over. And of course, Ed's focus was on motor system and motor control. Uh, so the questions were framed in that sense of what were the contributions of the basal ganglia to, to movement and uh, motor control. And at that time, basal ganglia was only thought to be involved in motor control. Yeah, basal ganglia were <coughs> viewed as components of the motor system, but hmm. rather dark and dusky, like uh, Kinnear Wilson likened them to a basement. Mm -hmm. uh, the dark and dusty, and uh, not sure what, what all was down there. Uh, and then and at that point, uh, I guess I came into the field uh, when the concepts were very simple, uh, that the basal ganglia were areas that received input from the cortex, all areas of cortex. They integrated, processed that information, and sent then output. F uh, Denny Brown had the idea and others that, that there was an actual uh, filtering or selection of the basal ganglia played a role in the selection because different cortical areas were thought to be competing for movements. I mean, in any situation, we have to do something that's appropriate to the environment and our history, our experience, and the basal ganglia were viewed as components of that system and actually given a rather major role in, in, action, in what we now call action selection uh, for the basal ganglia. So, but those commands, once they got out of the basal ganglia, were sent to the thalamus, and that <clears throat> was the same target that the cerebellum was viewed as projecting to, which was involved in coordination and more specific aspects of movement. And that command was then sent to the motor cortex. That was the anatomy of the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. Two systems receive cortical input, process that through their output nuclei, went to the same part of the thalamus to the cortex, motor cortex. So that was simple. Basal ganglia in 1960s. 1970. 1970. <laughs> okay. yeah, famous papers of Kemp and Powell yeah. and others. Um, and it, I, the reason I told that, told that a little bit is that it, it's a, it was kind of a starting point for our thinking uh, about the circuitry, which changed dramatically uh, as, as time went on. At, but at the very beginning at the NIH, um, 
Well, I said this was an interesting time <clears throat> because I, I largely stepped out of clinical work and uh, spent the five years uh, there. And <clears throat> the questions we were asking were for those that were very similar to what were being asked for the cerebellum and motor cortex. Uh, what aspects of movement were these uh, neurons in the basal ganglia related to? There, there was, uh, I would say, virtually no work at all or no data available on what single neurons were doing in the basal ganglia. Uh, so it was, it was wide open. There had been a couple studies, but it was clear they weren't sure what they were really recording and hadn't been systematic in any way. Uh, and nobody had recorded relations to movement. So we, we trained animals to move simple movements of their hand uh, or, or leg, uh, one part of the experiment. Others we looked more carefully. But so we found out where the cells were that were related to the different parts of the body, to the, to the arm, to the leg, and, and the oral facial movements, which we could examine. And these are all non-human primates? These are all in uh, rhesus monkeys, yeah. yeah. And trained, they were mm -hmm. trained animals. So the paradigm was to train an animal on a behavioral task and record the activity of neurons, and then you could correlate the discharge of those neurons to specific aspects of movement. Uh, onset of movement. Did they proceed, they changed their firing before the onset of movement, mm -hmm. or were they late? And how did that compare to the cerebellum and how to the motor cortex? And, um, but our first experiments showed that there were regions in the basal ganglia that were clearly related to these limb movements and body movements of body parts. But it was a smaller part of the basal ganglia than you would have imagined. Uh, in fact, it was the sort of caudal part of the globus pallidus, both the external and the internal segment. Uh, and we were looking at the output from the basal ganglia. That was our real focus, to see what the, what's the message coming out of the basal ganglia. And we saw these relations to very clear relations to specific aspects of movement. If the animal moved this way or this way, there were differences in the firing. So there was a directional component uh, as well as a specific, and, and we found that it was usually related to a single joint. Specific, very specific aspects of movement. So not too different from what we had seen or what others had seen in the cortex mm -hmm. and uh, cerebellum. But the, the, as it turned out somewhat later, when we looked at the timing more carefully, uh, it turned out that the basal ganglia were not quite as early as we, we expected. Uh, they ca came on more at, around the time of the change in, elect in EMG activity, which we monitored. Mm. So the basal ganglia were not necessarily, did not seem to be the initiators or the earliest uh, parts of the motor system to come into play. That's a, a separate topic in a way. But uh, this- So what, what was the first paper that came out from you? This was a, well, <laughs> well that's an interesting story. This is, Actually, I, I, I left out a very important part that uh, never, it, it played out in a way. Uh, we've, we, we, we were able to identify the discharge firing patterns of neurons in the uh, basal ganglia, in the different subnuclei and cells that were interspersed in the lamina of the pallidum. Uh, we called them border cells, and then there were neurons in the internal segment, neurons in the external segment. They were very different in their spontaneous activity, their firing patterns. Mm. Uh, we sort of described those in the putamen uh, later as well. Uh, so got very familiar. And how, how that happened was that uh, Ed Everts was very interested in sleep. And uh, we decided it would be interesting to look at the activity of these cells in wakefulness in, during movement and then during sleep. And so I spent almost a year recording <laughs> from uh, monkeys uh, during wakefulness, sleep and movement. And as you can imagine, the sleep part <laughs> became a major part of it because you had to wait for them to fall asleep and then record and see what was going on. You didn't give them hypnotics or anything to? <laughs> no, no. they. <laughs> They had their head <clears throat> fixed, so they they tended to fall asleep, you know, just mm -hmm. maybe boredom, 
they were, they were comfortable. But uh, we found that the cells during uh, rapid eye movement, during slow wave sleep, that the cellular activity reduced greatly. So as you think, the brain goes to sleep, kind of goes down. But during rapid eye movement sleep, the firing jumped up just like the animal was moving, acting, behaving. So it was, it, it, the brain was like awake. And so the, all those studies, and we, we tried to publish the data on sleep, uh, and uh, the editors and all, you know, reviewers said, oh, this is just descriptive stuff. You know, we're not <laughs> interested in that, <laughs> which to me was a shock. So mm -hmm. uh, we, the, the parts that we could Since report. Since no one had done that before. Nobody had done it before. And mm -hmm. you know, well, people hadn't looked at sleep. Yeah. Wakefulness. So this is not a new finding, but it was throughout the basal ganglion, very striking. Anyway, we, we then, but the first papers really dealt with this issue of movement-related neurons, where mm -hmm. they were, what their firing properties were in relation to movement. And it had defined a motor area of the basal ganglia. And then another whole area is that we could not find any cells related mm -hmm. to movement. They were doing other things, obviously. And that was the first insight into the sense that there was a motor and a non-motor part of the basal ganglia. That, that later became a very important piece. Um, and that, so what was... But we looked at the relationship to slow and fast movements. Mm -hmm. That took a couple of years because there was this concept that the basal ganglia might play a bigger role in slow than rapid ballistic movements. Uh, a, a, researcher named Kornhuber, a neurologist, had made that proposal. And we, we thought that was intriguing and actually showed that most of the activity that in the task was related to the slow movements. But in the end, could not dissect whether, out whether that was related to differences in the movement, uh, the way the animals perform slow versus fast, a lot of axial involvement, truncal involvement with the slow movements where they had to carefully steady themselves, it looked like. And it was with the fast movements, they were able to quickly move without a lot of truncal stabilization. But those, that was just kind of a side tour. That actually, several publications on that that raised a lot of questions that couldn't be really answered. Uh, but most of those studies uh, at NIH were, were on those topics. And, uh, so, so let me just... Just as an aside, Dr. Everett's, what was he like to work with? And so Ed, yeah, Ed, Ed, is, Ed was one of the most uh, brilliant people, I think, in the field. And he was uh, absolutely um, magnanimous in recruiting people to come learn this technique, uh, shared his technology, equipment, and helped people get started. Uh, so I was in a lab, or, you know, that was a beehive of activity. Uh, of course, the NIH at that time was just one of the most amazing places to be in the world because it was filled with people doing research uh, at the highest level. And interestingly, in, in, uh, in mental health was where, this was in mental health. Uh, Ed was a psychiatrist uh, in mental health. So this was a unique place. Uh, and. And he had internal funding, and he would say to you, "Oh, we have funding to do." Yeah, this. he was he was a staff. Yeah, yeah, and they there was this was a time of, you know, largesse, you know, <laughs> <laughs> resources, and uh, you know we could do what we wanted, pretty much. You know, just had to say what you were doing and mm -hmm. report, to the, but it was it was perform, pro forma more or less. One, but a wonderful time. And Ed Ed was as I said, John, this was a fabulous place because I met people coming through from all over the world, you know, were coming there to, to see how this was done and, and learn the technique. Um, so Ed, Ed was, Ed was a, 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 in a way, an interesting person apart from that. He, mm -hmm. uh, he, he wouldn't spend a lot of time with you until you got some data to show him. So for the first six months, I, I, I felt, boy, this, is really <laughs> this was a sudden switch from clinical Mm -hmm. to this research and it was and uh, fortunately there were wonderful people around to interact with so but uh, you know the first six months I would say were 
questioning, uh, how did I get here? <laughs> how did I land here? Uh, but it was all, it, and then it took off and it, it was fine. So he ended up dying young, is that right? It died, yeah. Uh, oh my goodness, uh, probably in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he had a aortic insufficiency and mm -hmm. di died suddenly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tragic. It was a great mm -hmm. loss uh, for the field. I, I think probably nobody, uh, virtually nobody, uh, made the kind of contribution that he did to the development of this technique. He didn't discover the technique of single cell recording and mm -hmm. behaving animals, but he, <clears throat> he championed it and saw the potential and took it forward. You know, he's, he's a great, a great person. Was, Ed was always very, very uh, supportive of his people. You know. So after NIH? You went so after to NIH, I went to Hopkins to do my residency training neurology, uh, and then stayed on there. Uh, my initial labs uh, were in physiology, and uh, we set up to do recording and primates, and uh, started then looking at the subthalamic nucleus, uh, particularly interested in that uh, as another input to the pallidum and a structure that had fascination to me because of hemibolismus. And uh, this was work with uh, Apostolos Georgopoulos that we also started looking at parameters of movement, more, you know, more rigorous behavioral control. And we began examining animals' responses to manipulations of joints, uh, skin, looking at the sensory uh, input as well as the motor output. Um, and Work okay. with, uh, and you were at Hopkins when MPTP was discovered, and right. that right. kind of changed things, right? Yes, yes. So just, I'll just complete the part. We, we then began looking at uh, the uh, putamen, uh, particularly in relation to input. Uh, uh, Mike Crutcher, you know, was mm -hmm. a colleague uh, at that time, or a graduate student working on that uh, parts, and, and looking at the role of striatum and organization. Same kind of story, very interesting things uh, about the somatotopy and the specificity. And uh, Garrett Alexander was there when we were working on, on that striatal piece as well, with mm -hmm. looking at microstimulation and finding excitable zones. And some very interesting studies that, you know, still have a lot of, raise a lot of questions about the organization and, and function. Um, and uh, Jerry, well, this, that's a little bit later. Uh, so MPTP, yeah, was uh, the big discovery. I, MPTP was uh, found, you know, it's discovered Langston's work and, and uh, the work done at the NIH in identifying uh, the MPTP as a selective, uh, rather selective neurotoxin for the dopamine neurons. Uh, this provided a primate model that was like unlike anything available I mean because it it really reproduced the dopamine deficiency syndrome in, in the animal uh, all the features slowness tremor rigidity uh, although the tremor was not the resting tremor it was a more high frequency tremor uh, I, so before that, you were mostly doing anatomy and... So, so I, one thing I didn't say yeah. is yeah. that when I was at the NIH, I wasn't thinking at all about movement disorders. Or disease, The only right? question was, what are the basal ganglia doing? Mm -hmm. How are they organized? Yeah. Uh, what, what's their contribution? This was, this was the theme of the Everett's lab, and, mm -hmm. and you know, that was really... Main focus. I, when MPTP came along, I thought, boy, this would be interesting to look at. In the, now, because I, I know this is my backyard, right. I know how to, you know, look at it. But I was doing my residency when all this was happening, and I was thinking, well, I really bad timing. You know, <laughs> somebody else is going to do all this, and it turns out that people did, but they didn't, to my mind, really have enough of the background to to do it in a way that was rigorous. And, and actually, an interesting little story. Uh, when we started doing that, uh, 
the proposal was kind of reviewed as a PhD thesis level because, and I remember Vernon uh, saying, I don't, I mean, I, I don't want to paraphrase him exactly, but it was, he was skeptical mm -hmm. that we would see any changes in activity of neurons mm -hmm. in the basal ganglia. So, and I thought, well, <laughs> wait, you got Parkinson's disease and no changes in neural activity? Oh, no way. And it was day one uh, when we started this. Uh, Bill Miller was a graduate student who who'd started this work and carried it through. Uh, day one, dramatic changes in the firing and the pattern of firing of neurons in the globus pallidus. Uh, so it was wide open from there on. So. We saw all of the changes that, that we, you know about. I mean, the bursting, the mm -hmm. oscillations, changes in firing rate, uh, increased in. And you said at that time you were interested in the SDN, so. Well, we had done too. the SDN, yeah. yeah. But uh, but the focus here was on the globus pallidus. Mm -hmm. uh, SDN we did as well, but the focus was on the output at, at that point. And a lot of that was to kind of examine the, you know, the concept that there was a, you know, Ann Young and Jack Penny had the model of, out, this, this actually model is multi, multi-sourced, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, the, the, some of the nuclear medicine studies and, and our recording and, and, uh, and, and the anatomy sort of all came together to suggest that maybe this pathway through the external pallidum so what we called later called the indirect pathway mm -hmm. was overactive, and that that lack of disinhibition, loss of dopamine in the striatum, unleashing that activity, and the excessive palatal, excessive drive from the subthalamic nucleus to the internal pallidum, giving rise to this extra inhibitory output, and count, then leading to some of the Parkinsonian features was was part of that scheme. Uh, the, the actual lesioning came later. I mean, really the first was the confirming the model, more or less, or supporting the model. Uh, of so you did some palatal lesioning? No, we did <coughs> not do palatal. Oh. No, hmm. no. Uh, when, uh, this was a little bit later when uh, uh, Thomas, Wickman, uh, Haggai Bergman were in the lab. Uh, was, Thomas was a resident, <laughs> had finished, uh, and Haggai was the fellow uh, coming. So we had uh, looked at, we had decided, well, we've got to test this model really to see what we'll, fi what we'll find out. I mean, the prediction is pretty obvious if you do a subthalamic lesion interrupt that excessive abnormal activity, you should be able to modify uh, activity, you modify the Parkinsonism. It was controversial, wasn't it, whether to lesion the STN or not at that time because of the hemibilismus and right. the... So, so it wasn't controversial to test it in the primate mm -hmm. uh, because we, 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 we could inactivate it actually with selective neurotoxins. Uh, we could radio frequency. We could well, th those were the tools available, and so those those selectively selective inactivation was the, the the cleanest because it was really just reversibly inhibiting uh, neural activity, and that was absolutely dramatic. It was immediate, almost instantaneous animal that was. Parkinsonian, tremulous, akinetic. Uh, even just doing one side of the brain uh, became mobile, started moving, facial expression improved, I mean, reactivity, you know, all of the things that you see. Uh, it, was, uh, it was one of those raw aha moments. Mm -hmm. you know, of, and you uh, published that in 1990. Right. Yeah, that was a big, 
a big event. And you know, people got worried then. Uh, we had inquiries. Uh, two, two things. Uh, people got uh, we were proposing a return to surgical ablative procedures, which had been done in the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. of course, not in the STM, but in the paladin. Yeah. And indeed, we did, because it was so dramatic. And uh, we ended up, as you, uh, as you said, uh, we, we ended up beginning that work here at Emory with the pallidotomies, because we were fearful that an STM lesion could either cause bilismus, uh, or might cause bleeding. Uh, the subthalamic nucleus is the most highly vascularized mm. structure in the brain. So, I mean, it's just a tangle of vessels, you know. So, there was always, and, and a lot of the lesions there are somewhat hemorrhagic. So, there, there were those two factors that mm -hmm. actually, as you know, uh, went on later with uh, Obezo and the group in Cuba and right. did studies showing that. In fact, you can lesion the subthalamic nucleus in Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease and get quite good, good results. results. Yeah. So let's go back. So yep. 90 you came to Emory or 91? 90. 90. You became chairman of the department. Right. So um, talk about that, becoming chairman, making that decision to go from Hopkins to the chair of Emory. And right. So what? That was. Uh, that was an interesting decision, uh, and it was not something I had planned, although I, I must say I had looked at a couple of places. Uh, my, my idea was to really try to find a place where there were resources to really uh, develop a more intense, rigorous, and well-supported primate uh, capability mm -hmm. uh, for research. Emory had I, I came down because colleagues here I knew in basic science asked me to just come take a look because they were starting to search for the chair. And uh, I came and saw, and I was really amazed in a way because of the primate center, Yerkes Primate Center, which was really a, a, a truly unique resource. Uh, just the fact that Emory at that time had gotten a large amount of money from the Woodruff Foundation, uh, the largest gift to any higher institution, higher education. What was it, 270 million or something? Well, I think it was 125 million at Initially, the time, but it was yeah. in Coke stock, which yeah. then became quite a bit more money. Uh, and uh, I, I thought, this is a very interesting <laughs> place, uh, you know, after, after visiting, and uh, upshot was that we, it moved along, some people say slowly, uh, some say quickly, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, it, was, it was clear to me this is one of the best opportunities uh, for what I was looking for uh, it would come along. And actually, it was, it was interesting that Guy McCann, my chair, the chair at Hopkins, uh, told me afterwards, not afterwards, but after I was already into the process, that he thought it was one of the best opportunities and had actually been one of the consultants for the dean in the search. So, and suggested so Guy had probably, <laughs> probably behind the scenes played some, mm -hmm. some role in, in all of that. And Guy McCann is, of course, the person who's been probably most important in my clinical and professional career since Ed. I mean, yeah. Ed, guys played a major role in that. So you came here. So. There was a very small department. There were right. something like 11 neurologists here. Right. And um, by the time you finished 14 years later, the department was, uh, you know, uh, one of the major departments in the, in the States, over 60 faculty, I believe. So right. tell me how you, how did you do that? And you know, what resources were made available to you and... Right. So, yeah, I, it, it's funny to think back on that and uh, realize how, if you knew, if, if I had known too much, I might have wondered whether it was possible. 
but uh, the dean was extremely supportive. Jeff Haupt uh, was probably as supportive as any dean can be. He had just taken over, uh, and I was the first chair he recruited. And I remember him calling. We kind of got down to the last day, and uh, he wanted me to give him an answer. Well, no, it wasn't the last day, but it was like, and I, I, had, I had decided to go, but I said, you know, just one thing we have to have, and that is a uh, pet imaging program center. Uh, and that, that was like a $14 million mm -hmm. piece of cake, <laughs> something like that. He called me back two hours later and said, okay, it's a done deal. So that did it. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, a lot of negotiations right. and things beforehand. And, and we had some resources, for sure, from the dean to recruit and start going. But it was more like four or five faculty. Mm -hmm. not, not, oh, really? Well, mm -hmm. depending how you yeah. carve up and who you recruit and all of that. We, we of course, brought... Well, I just remember that the movement disorder group he, here at Emory was Ray Watts and Alan Freeman and... Jorge yeah. Junco. And Jorge, right. So that's what I was going to say, too, mm -hmm. is that coming was a great opportunity <clears throat> to create a large movement disorder program without recruiting anybody, just because of the people who came mm -hmm. uh, and the people who were here, Ray, of course, and uh, Jorge, and uh, Alan Freeman. So sort of brought together forces and we, you know, we, we were very collegial and mm -hmm. worked, worked very well together. Uh, but the money that was came after was probably as more important. Uh, we were able to get contributions from grateful patients and from foundations. Uh, and the university was a, was willing to match in some of those. And so we, we just kept recruiting. And the people who came were, were successful in getting grants. And so the whole programs expanded in stroke and uh, epilepsy and movement disorders and neuromuscular. I mean, so there was a, a lot of growth across the department. Of course, Coming as a chair, you always have to realize that it's not just your lab and your reason. <laughs> it's, right. it's a department, so <clears throat> there's a lot of lot of time. And you brought a lot balancing. of people from Hopkins too over the next few years. Over the next few years, yeah, more people came. Yeah, yeah so it ended up. But these were exciting. So maybe Guy wasn't so happy that you. <laughs> Guy was fine. Guy. <laughs> I think Guy was fine. Well, no, but we, we joke about Emory North and mm -hmm. Hopkins South and yeah. all those things. So when you became chair, though, you um, stepped out of the lab, and yeah. most of your work became yeah. pallidotomies. And so when did you do the first pallidotomy here? 92. Mm -hmm. December 92. And so Emory was yeah. probably the first place in the States in the modern era to do those after the Leitman paper and... So, the, uh, yeah, this is an interesting story. I, there were some people who had done pallidotomies. I mean, pallidotomies were not new. Those were right. done in the 50s and 60s. Irving Cooper was doing yeah, lots uh, of them. Yeah. A lot of people did, did them. And they moved mm -hmm. to the thalamus, largely. Mm -hmm. uh, in those early days, people were more focused on tremor. Mm -hmm. And they, Cooper had shown accidentally, but discovered, I'd say, that, that the thalamic target gave better results for tremor. So a lot of that activity shifted and, uh, to the thalamus. And the, other than Lori Leighton, who quietly continued doing pallidotomies, um, Svenelson had shown and actually that the target that had been used previously for the pallidotomies, the classic target was too anterior and was not mm -hmm. really in what we would have said is the motor circuit where we identified the target. And uh, so what we brought to the pallidotomy was the mapping technique that really identified the sensory motor part of the GPI. And then we were able to lesion that guided by the microelectrode mapping uh, in a way that was more 
comprehensive, extensive. And we found that if you didn't get a large, rather complete lesion, you would lose benefits. Mm -hmm. The patient would lose benefits. Um, and if you didn't get that target, you, even if it was large and you were too anterior, you wouldn't. Uh, and so we saw a number of patients who had needed revi revisions of their pallidotomy. So I was told the first pallidotomy you did took 13 or 14 hours, is that right? It, it, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, we, I think we started at 9 or 10 a.m. and mm -hmm. finished at 2 a.m., so whatever that adds mm -hmm. up to is... How many passes did you do at that time? We, well, you know? we did a lot of mapping yeah. and uh, put the uh, electrode in. It was one of this, this was another aha moment mm -hmm. uh, when we put one, we, we made just one big lesion in the center of our mapped target uh, and it was absolutely dramatic. It was just melted away all the rigidity, tremor, akinesia. Uh, pallidotomies... Must have been an amazing moment. Pallidotomies were the most uh, sort of... Uh, I won't say stimulating, but they were most rewarding uh, immediate kind of benefit, uh, which you don't see now with the DBS. You do because you can stimulate and produce these effects, but it's somehow much more dramatic and immediate. I think it's just the completeness uh, of, of, the, of the lesioning. And so patients would experience this release of tension, feel they could have been un unchained, unlocked, and start moving, tremor would go away. And so, sometimes sensory sensations would, mm -hmm. would improve, and they would they would cry, release. Of, and you were finding bilateral effects, right? So bilateral effects mm -hmm. for uh, slowness of movement, for the for the bradykinesia mm -hmm. in particular, not so much for the tremor, uh, and and the rigidity also shows. And those we found persisting, mm -hmm. in, in many patients. Uh, years later. Yeah, so now it's 2013 and I've actually seen a couple of these patients right. who still maintain benefit. So, uh, right, yeah, it's it, a well-done pallidotomy is, uh, is yeah. well, I mean, is, has lasting uh, benefit and yeah, we still follow patients who yeah. have had their pallidotomy. Hey doc, this is, <laughs> this is the one you did first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's always the worst one. Yeah. We always did, did the worst one first, yeah. So it was about Five or six years later, DBS came in, mm -hmm. and uh, now DBS is really the procedure of choice. But what what are some of your thoughts about the switchover, and should we doing be doing DBS? Do you think pallidotomy was something we shouldn't have stopped doing, or? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I think I, I think it, it realized that pallidotomy was not abandoned because it was an inferior uh, benefit or result. Uh, I mean, the, the studies are not comparable in terms of depth or whatnot, but um, the, 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 uh, the advantage, of course, of DBS is the idea that you are, it's a reversible lesion, which is kind of strange because as, as uh, I, for, I, for, I forgot to mention, of course, Jerry Vitek and uh, Roy Bacay mm -hmm. as being the key people here. Here at Emory, mm -hmm. yeah, and this, and so the three of us really started. You know, it was like we're going to do this, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I mean, sort of very fond memories of years and years of working together uh, in the in this initial period of pallidotomy when there was a lot of excitement and interest. Uh, it's so, just thinking myself about when I was in Albany and we started doing mm -hmm. DBS. It must have taken courage to think we're going to go into someone's brain and we're going to burn a hole in their pallidum. And even though we know the circuitry, and it's still a little nerve-wracking to be. We had doing we that. had we had done this at Hopkins mm -hmm. in the thalamus. Mm -hmm. We had with Fred Lenz and, yeah. uh, and then uh, uh, Hank Nauta, who came as well. We had we had gone through a lot of we had done a lot of functional surgery mm -hmm. and we're very interested in the thalamus and kind of let that whole story aside but, yeah. but uh, we had we had gotten comfortable with lesioning and, and being able to control it so mm -hmm. I, I don't think it wasn't courage it was mm -hmm. just you know hoping it would work mm -hmm. and, uh, 
were successful you know, and safe. Uh, uh, but but the the thing about lesioning, I think, is that it is not something that uh, has well, it's been a, not abandoned, but it's certainly now been relegated uh, mm -hmm. to a, a lo another level. I mean, there are many patients who a number of patients who cannot have hardware right. uh, erosions uh, or in, in risk of infection uh, being part, part of that. Some people just do not want to have a, a device. Right. They, they want to have a procedure and go and have it done. And that's have it, it done. Yeah. yeah. And I must say, we you know we still do pallidotomies and thalamotomies occasionally, and the, it's like, well, we did it. We done. Mm -hmm. We've done our job. Yeah. The problem is it's much harder to do a good pallidotomy or a good thalamotomy, and you have only one chance. Right. Uh, so a lot more is riding on that. The, the microelectrode technique or, or the uh, DBS is far more forgiving uh, mm -hmm. because you can play with the stimulation parameters, contacts, and you have more, yeah. more opportunity, even if you're not quite on target, uh, so I think that that's a a big advantage, certainly. And and DBS has allowed us to go places where nobody would have gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, because of the tolerability and the, and the yeah. safety of it. And so I mean, I think I think DBS has really proven not only to be a major therapeutic tool but to open research avenues that would not have been mm -hmm. otherwise, you know. So, so where is it going? I think we're still using the same technology that uh, we started with 20 years ago, and uh, not quite, but almost. And continuous high frequency stimulation is turn it on and set it and turn it on. And there's clearly uh, opportunities here for different different kinds of stimulation parameters to uh, provide more efficient, more effective uh, stimulation mm. uh, than just continuous, uh, constant current devices, uh, closed loop systems that you know operate in a servo mode to take signals and apply it for short periods of time. Potentially, and there's ways of stimulating to break up, uh, you know, sort of the kindling like experiments or break up synergies. Now, one of the big problems in basal ganglia, or, or mechanism of Parkinson's and dystonia and these disorders, is the abnormal synergies that develop between neighboring neurons, uh, oscillations and synergies, and to break those up is an important piece of potential different ways of stimulating, uh, sort of reset the, the system. Uh, Palo, I, I think the DBS clearly has tremendous potential. Uh, other disorders, we're expanding into Alzheimer's, and of course Tourette's already. Uh, uh, other psychiatric neuro, disease. Other neuropsychiatric disorders, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, depression of course. Where we're going forward, uh, and I think that new targets. We've not. We largely use old targets uh, that were used for pallidotum or for ablative procedures. So that's. But they work. Well, let's talk about. Um, yeah, yeah. You spent a lot of time in Japan with Narubayashi. Right. Can you say a little bit about some of those experiences? What he was like to work with? And yeah. So the time with uh, in Japan, I was uh, we had we had a lot of uh, exchange with uh, the uh, la a lab in Japan, the Tokyo Metropolitan Institute, uh, Noriichi Mano and uh, Ikuma Hamada and others came, uh, fellows working and colleagues working together. And uh, one of the great benefits of that time was the. Time spent with uh, Narabayashi, uh, who was probably as much of a pioneer in this whole 
uh, functional neurosurgery approach as you can find in the world. And, and so we would go there on Saturdays to watch him do a thalamotomy or a pallidotomy. He later, he had abandoned pallidotomies and initially in many years he was doing thalamotomies. And it was wonderful. <laughs> and he brought people in from all over the Tokyo mm -hmm. to come to his, and we'd sit and talk and think about what was going on, and then uh, he started doing pallidotomies again after we had kind of re restarted them on this side. Uh, and he was never quite as happy with them as, and it was always an issue about the old target versus the, the new, more posterior target. Mm -hmm. But he was a wonderful person. He, he took us on tours in Japan and uh, in the world. We took him fishing when he came here. <laughs> Not quite the same in the Chesapeake. That's great. Yeah. That's great. So I was just thinking you were talking about people would come to Japan to see him do this, but when you started doing pallidotomy here, all these physicians from all over the country started coming here to watch you do pallidotomies. And right. I actually remember when I was in Albany, we wanted to come and you were booked out for six months. It was almost like your patient schedule. <laughs> And you couldn't get people in. So, what was that like having all these people come in? And uh... well, it was uh, it was it was wonderful, of course, to have people come and, and see. Uh, we always felt that things might might get the impression that you could do this just by watching one. And mm -hmm. we knew that every case was different. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people thought, I think that they saw it once and it mm -hmm. worked. <laughs> we were always happy when it not happy, but we were always felt better when there was things we had to solve during the procedure. Yeah. It was not, a, not uncommon because each map, mm -hmm. each mapping was different and the patient were different and targeting. Mm -hmm. But it was a wonderful experience because we got, got to meet a lot of people. Yeah, and really made a okay. big impact, I think, in the availability of this surgery around the country. Right, so. right. Yeah, and, and I, <coughs> I, I have very fond memories of our mm -hmm. pallidotomy mm -hmm. era, the pallidotomy era. So, um, would you recommend becoming a chair? So things have changed so you were, much. You were a chair 14 years, which is right. a long time. 14 years, yeah. Things have changed so much since uh, the time I thought about it. It changed about four or five years after I came. It became so much more uh, business uh, emphasis on revenue and those things. Uh, but the whole field had, has changed as well. Uh, I think chair, chair for me was a wonderful experience. And I, I have never regretted that decision at all. It was, I, mean, I always had that strange idea that the best thing that you could do, or the best if you could, was be to kind of live part of your life and then bring together as many people you could that you really loved and, you know, wanted to be with and mm -hmm. would work and so it was kind of like a, a strange fantasy <laughs> try to bring together all the people you'd, you'd really like to have and we were able to do a lot of bring together a lot of people who uh, worked well together i think 14 years was about enough time or <laughs> so I, I exceeded my limit actually uh, guy mccann had always said and told me he said 10 years is your is the lifespan of a chair. He didn't mean life as a liver, mm -hmm. but life as, as a, chair. As a effective, chair. effective chair because yeah. you kind of get resources when you come mm -hmm. and if you do a good job you get a refresher, mm -hmm. you know, and then you, by that ten, end of that 10 years you, you're probably not going to get a lot more unless you're doing something. Yeah. <laughs> so, I felt, uh, I thought, well, I, I did above and beyond the call of mm -hmm. duty. And it's always better mm -hmm. to just bring new people in, you know, bring, move, move aside, bring, let people come yeah. and uh, get, the, get the work done. Yeah. And I just want to ask you, um, work-life experience and balancing, but you took a sabbatical in 2000 with your son as part of your life 
part of experience. It was a desert survival experience. Can you say a little about? This is that? really, really a little bit of an aside, but right. Uh, but yeah, uh, my. But you said it was a big. It was. A, it was a. It had it a big was, impact on your life. So. Yeah. So, we were, my youngest son and I, John, uh, always wished that we had been Indians, uh, and were sort of hunter gatherers. You know, we we liked to forage. When we would go, we would fish. Or, we're not hunters. Mm -hmm. Fishing, scrounging, uh, surviving in a way. And so there was this great opportunity to go to the desert uh, as part of a program that BOSS, B-O-S-S, -S, runs uh, on primitive survival. So we so BOSS is the Boulder Outdoor Survival School. Yeah, it's a commercial for Baltimore, <laughs> or not Baltimore. Or Boulder, yeah. Boulder yeah. Uh, Outdoor Survival School. Mm -hmm. And it uh, it was truly unique. Uh, we, we must, I must say, we were not prepared for what it really turned out to be because the advertisement sort of said, bring along all these pieces of equipment and, you know, you'll be fine. Uh, we did. And then the second day, we, we kind of went out into the desert and Really, this was high desert in Utah. Uh, uh, I think it's the Escalante region. Uh, cut off, no communication. And uh, spent a few days getting ready, learning how to do primitive, make primitive things like glass to make a knife, you know, obsidian knife, uh, a little bit of weaving to make a mat, uh, make a clay pot. So they said, okay, pack up all your stuff that you brought. We're going to put that in a trailer, <laughs> and we're going into the wilderness. And so we went with just shoes, pants, shirt, hat, and, you know, whatever vitals you had to take with you. That was it. And so we, we were on our own, water, food, everything, for 10 days, uh, totally cut off from any contact with the world, <laughs> but with two guides who were and, and you were and you were chairman then. So and I was chairman. Yeah, it's so hard it, to cut off yourself from. <laughs> this was almost yeah. unthinkable, but uh -huh. uh, it pro uh, I, I could I could tell you lots of little stories and besides I won't I'll spare you all that. But uh, it was it was incredible experience, and uh, we learned to survive, and you know it was absolutely incredible how uh, difficult it was, but at the same time how peaceful and serene it was mm -hmm. that you had nothing else to do but explore this canyon or set a trap or fish, you know, and we would fish with, with our hands. hands in the water. <laughs> we had no fishing equipment mm -hmm. at all, but that's called lunking. Mm -hmm. you know, when you, and actually the fish will come to you, but they had largely been wiped out by a strong storm that had come through earlier and uh, washed them out. This sounds like water in the desert, doesn't make sense, but there are streams in the mm -hmm. deep, in the depths way down. And uh, uh, it, it, there, it was filled with experiences that were, you would never have had other times. And, and survival and resuscitation, mm -hmm. I would say. <laughs> Made it Probably very changed your relationship Our, with your son too. Well, it it, it didn't change, but mm -hmm. it certainly refreshed. Yeah. And uh, we found afterwards that you know it was like a special thing that nobody else had. We, we have that bond, that shared experience. That mm -hmm. was, it was a tremendous uh, uh, time. And of course, you know there were other people there as well. And got to know them very well. And yeah. Experienced. Them. That's good. And one more question. Yeah. So one last question, just so what advice would you give for young people coming into our field now? You've had 40 years of this or so. Yeah, or more. more. Yeah. So well, I think, I, I think, uh, <laughs> does my experience make any difference? Uh, I, I can only say that in, in, in retrospect, uh, most of the decisions I made were rather kind of high level things like, I'm going to do this or that. Where can I do that best? Uh, and then finding that and taking the time apart, sort of not 
not thinking too clearly about end result, or uh, thinking about end result, but I mean, opportunities just come up and uh, you, you, you have to seize, seize them and take advantage of them. Uh, I think I've been extremely fortunate in all my life of having been in, at, kind of at the right place at the right time. I think that's a very stroke of luck. Uh, you know, the people who have made major impact, uh, Don Kennedy, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. um, that was, you know, go east and uh, support for that. And Guy McCann, I mean, that was a tremendous crew of people at, at Hopkins. I mean, it was like a brand new neurology department mm -hmm. out of the ashes, not the ashes, but just at a, at a very auspicious time uh, for that, and guys, guidance and support. And then it had an Everett's lab again. Uh, so, but opportunities along the way. Uh, in life, life to me seems like, in a, a strange way, something that happens when you're making plans, and it isn't always where you, you don't go necessarily where you plan to go, but take opportunities. But probably the best times I've had have been where I was working intensely on something. The, the time at the NIH was just unparalleled because I, I had simple, my life was simple. I had to research and lab. And that, that's a time, the era that may be <laughs> harder and harder to accomplish where mm -hmm. you can actually just say, okay, I'm just going to do this now. I agree. You know, Certainly in university life. That's, yeah, really hard that's right. Yeah, I mean, the NIH was unique uh, in, okay. in that sense. And then you said 80% of life is... Oh, yeah, well, I didn't say that, but, <laughs> but I believe 80% is showing up. Yeah. <laughs> that makes a difference. Okay. Well, that's great. Thanks, Mayla. Appreciate it. Thank you. It. Thank you. <laughs>